Hey, everybody. So our next chapter is beginning, and this one is going to be on carbohydrates. And it's fairly complicated, so I figured I would go a little slowly, and we'll, and we'll talk more about it um, on Tuesday with some actual examples and class discussion. So I'm going to start with monosaccharides. They're the simplest, and we'll go from there. But basically, we're going to talk about how these are um, basic energy storage for, you know, basically all life on Earth. And so it's important we understand their chemistry, and we're really going to start to put together um, some of the lessons we've learned, particularly about stereochemistry, because stereochemistry is going to be really, really important um, for this particular chapter. And we'll begin to realize that three-dimensional shapes of molecules are so critical, um, particularly in biological chemistry. So let's talk about them. So we're going to recognize what carbohydrates look like and start starting with the simplest monosaccharides disaccharides, two of them linked together, and then polysaccharides, and then be able to classify individual molecules as aldoses, which are the ones that have aldehyde uh, functional groups, ketoses, which have ketone functional groups, and then triose, tetrose, pentose, hexose, depending on how many carbons um, there are. And then starts to come the uh, stereochemistry, which, like I said, it's going to be super, super important. D sugars and L sugars. Um, for some reason that nature has selected, um, we really only use D sugars. And I'll explain the difference between D and L. Um, we should be able to identify the difference between the different um, uh, monosaccharides and be able to tell just by looking at them whether or not they're D sugars and can be consumed uh, in, and made into longer uh, molecules or whether they're L. And we'll define the difference between enantiomers, diastereomers, anomers, all these different uh, ways of describing these molecules. Um, it'll be fun, confusing, but also uh, we're going to learn a lot. So we're going to learn about the different physical and chemical properties of monosaccharides, see what um, sucrose, lactose, and maltose look like. Those are the most common disaccharides. And then be able to compare what they look like and then look at some of the um, longer polysaccharides, the most re the really, really important ones, such as starch and glycogen for storing um, energy in us and a lot of other uh, creatures, and cellulose, which we all know is the main property of wood, which we probably didn't realize is just sugar. Um, we can't eat it and digest it, but uh, termites certainly can, and so we'll explain why that is. So carbohydrates, they're just sugars and provide um, energy um, every day. You're probably eating too many carbohydrates if you're like me. And the basic ingredient of carbohydrates that we use is like the simplest um, form of energy is glucose. Like glucose is the single form of energy that your brain uses, for instance. Uh, really can't use anything else. And so also brain and red uh, blood cells. So your bodies break down glucose and simple sugars by oxidation. And we know, based on some of the, re some of the learning we've done before about alcohols, um, how alcohols get oxidized. Alcohols get oxidized into aldehydes and ketones, and then finally into carboxylic acids. And then once they're completely um, oxidized, all their energy is removed and we get to power ourselves. Um, 
So what we'll find out is that carbohydrates are actually alcohols in that they have hydroxyl groups attached to carbons, but not just one, many, many different uh, carbons. So the functional groups on carbohydrates are the um, hydroxy groups, of which there are a large number. But interestingly, they're going to be broken down into two different groups, one with aldehydes and then one with ketones. They're going to be part of the monosaccharides. There's basically two different groups. And then how photosynthesis fits in here, photosynthesis um, is the very process by which plants convert CO2 and water and add energy to make these particular sugars for us and release oxygen. So not only does it take CO2 out of the air and produce oxygen for us to breathe, that also gives us uh, glucose for energy as well. So obviously inc incredibly important process. So the simplest carbohydrate, as I mentioned, monosaccharide. Mono is one, and saccharis, I guess that's how it might be pronounced, is Greek for sugar. So it just means one sugar. And then these really, you know, they're pretty, they're fairly uh, sweet. Um, glucose is fairly sweet sugar. They can't be broken down any further. That's like the simplest unit of, of, of carbohydrate we can find. And the most common one, glucose, is the most common monosaccharide. So you can tell whether or not something is a monosaccharide by looking at the formula. Now the formula basically is carbon and two hydrogens and an oxygen for every one of those carbons. Now the carbon has to have a number three or higher. We would call that a triose because it has three carbons. Um, the most uh, common uh, monosaccharides we're going to look at are all hexoses with six carbons. So you can see that these carbons are either going to have hydrogen on one side or hydroxyl on the other. So that's why we have this formula uh, for every carbon, two hydrogens and an oxygen. So di disaccharides makes sense two saccharides, two monosaccharide units joined together. Um, and you can split that up easily through hydrolysis. Because we know a lot of the reactions, a lot of the organic reactions we've, we've looked at so far are dehydrating reactions. So like for instance, the ester formation. When you have ester formation, when you have a carboxyl group, and you have an alcohol. And when they come together, you release water. Well, these are also um, ester bonds. And so you have breakage of them by adding water. And we call that hydrolysis, which is basically the opposite of a dehydration reaction. And so sucrose, which you're probably familiar with, that's table sugar. We, you know, bake with it, eat it, you know, pretty much every day. That gets split into glucose and fructose. Glucose, we know about fructose is basically fruit sugar. And then each of those gets converted back into, uh, fructose gets converted into glucose and then gets broken down and energy released uh, by your body. So oligosaccharides are much longer chains. Um, they have three to nine units. And one of the things we'll, we're going to uh, mention about oligosaccharides, which are really, really important, the blood typing groups, type O, type A, type B, AB, um, all of those are defined by oligosaccharides on the presence of uh, red blood cells. And so we'll talk about exactly which sugars those are and how they're organized and how your body recognizes them.
So when you have more than 10 monosaccharide units, instead of having oligosaccharides, we now call them polysaccharides, many, many saccharides. Now these can be huge. These can have tens of thousands of individual uh, monosaccharides stacked together. And not only can they be in one continuous chain, we can also, they can be branched as well. So you can have branches coming off and making these really, really, really large molecules. So starch, we're probably familiar with starch. Potatoes uh, are a source of starch. That's polysaccharide that's made in plants. Um, that contains branched chains of glucose. And we can then strip off uh, the glucose molecules individually and break them down for energy. So here are the classes, basically. We have monosaccharides, we just have a single, single unit, usually with six carbons, but not always. Um, disaccharides, two of them linked together. Oligo, up to nine. And then polysaccharides, as is here, up to like 10,000 or, 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 or more. They can be really, really large molecules. So let's look at the functional groups. So I've already mentioned that the main functional group that's used in converting these molecules to energy are the hydroxyl groups. These are the groups that are gonna get oxidized uh, first into ketones and then into carboxylic acids. So they're gonna get oxidized and the energy from the uh, oxidation gets converted into energy that we can use. Now, the other functional group, which is really, really important, is at the end. And when we write these uh, uh, monosaccharides in this form, we always put the functional group on top. And there's two basic kinds. We have an aldehyde. We're familiar with the um, aldehyde group. We have a carbonyl group here, C double bond O, and a hydrogen. We also have what are called ketoses. So these are aldoses for aldehydes over here. And these are ketoses for the ketone group. So instead of having the aldehyde on the top, we have a group, another carbon group with a hydroxyl on it. And then the ketone functional group goes on carbon two. So we start numbering from the top down to the bottom. So that would be on carbon number two. So monosaccharides have these different functional groups. And then you have to uh, imagine that the shape of these is going to be really important. How are we going to, how are we going to um, indicate uh, the structure of them? Well, you remember when we were looking at the shapes of molecules, we had two ways of, of marking them. Coming off of a carbon, if we had a bond coming out at us, we would put in a wedge. And if we had a bond going away from us to the back, we would put in these check marks. So we do the same thing here. Basically, um, you can see that all of these groups, all these uh, hydroxyl groups, they're all coming out of the plane. It'll be important to look at that because, as I mentioned, uh, the stereochemistry of uh, sugars is extremely important. So we look for the aldehyde group or the ketone group, we put that at the top, and then we look at basically the spine of, of the sugar and we see which ways the hydroxyl and, and, the, and the hydrogens are coming off. Now, each one of these carbons is chiral. Each and every one of them is a chiral carbon because they're connected to four different things. And so it's important to remember that these aren't planar. These chiral carbons are tetrahedral, just like we see in methane. Carbon makes four bonds, four, and they're separated by 109.5 degrees, approximately. So they're tetrahedral. 
And so these bonds that we're looking at are coming out at us. So the ketone uh, family looks like, I mean, the ketoses look a lot like um, the aldoses, with the exception, of course, of, of uh, the ketone group. Now, the difference is there's carbons on both sides of the ketone group. That's what makes it a ketone. There's a carbon on either side. But when you have an aldose, and in this instance, we would call it an aldohexose because there's six carbons, that's at the very end, at the very top um, of the molecule. And we'll find um, both of them in, in nature. This comes back to remember how we classified alcohols, since um, these are basically polyalcohols. Uh, we have to remember what the rules are for whether or not they're primary, secondary, or tertiary. So remember that when we're dealing with alcohols, we're really looking at the carbon that's connected to the hydroxyl group. Unlike amines, remember we were looking at amines, Amines, we were looking at the nitrogen and what's directly attached to the nitrogen. Well, alcohols have to have a group attached to a carbon in order for it to be called uh, an alcohol. And so we have to look at the carbon that it's attached to and see how many carbons that it's attached to. So we look at the, at the carbon connected to the functional group. And you remember, when there's only one carbon, we call that a primary alcohol. So basically, in this instance, the alcohol group is at the very end of the molecule. It's at the one end or the other. If it's a secondary alcohol, then there's two carbons chains attached to it. And then there'd only be a single hydrogen attached to that carbon. Also another way to identify whether it's a, a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol, look at the carbon that the hydroxyl group is attached to. If there are two carbons, or if there's two hydrogens, then it's primary. If there's only one hydrogen, it's secondary. And if there's no hydrogens at all, attached to the carbon. If there's just three different carbon groups attached to it, plus the hydroxyl, then we call that a tertiary alcohol, okay? And we'll, we'll review this again on Tuesday. So the naturally occurring uh, monosaccharides have either three and up to seven carbon molecules, carbon atoms molecules, atoms, per molecule. And if you want to give it the specific size, you just, you, you, the stem part would say how many carbons there are. And then you use the suffix os, hexos, pentose, um, triose, tetraose, to say how many carbons there are. And then you would use the term aldose when there's an aldehyde present and then ketose when there's, when there's a ketone group present, all right? Now we get into um, the stereochemistry. And this is gonna be really important, so I'll try and, I'll try and explain it as, 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 as well as I can. Again, we'll talk more about it on Tuesday. So we sort of were introduced to the whole idea of a stereoisomer. Now that is an isomer that has the same structural formula, but the arrangement of atoms or groups of atoms in three-dimensional space are different. And so there's a lot of different types of, of stereoisomers. The most important one that we're gonna be dealing with are enantiomers. That may be a new word. We may have talked about it a little bit before, but enantiomers are basically mirror images of each other 
but because they're three-dimensional, like my two hands are mirror images of each other, but you can't superimpose them. You can't put one hand on top of the other to make them be identical. They're mirror images and you can't superimpose them. So my two hands are over here in antiomers. And we're gonna see that a lot because that is gonna be the difference between D and L sugars. One is gonna be one mirror image and one is gonna be the other one. And as I mentioned, your body can digest one of them and the other one, it can't, even though they're identical molecules in every other way. And so we've been introduced to the concept of chiral carbon. A chiral carbon just has four different groups attached to it. Um, so on these uh, monosaccharides, we saw that there were four chiral carbons. And so if there's four chiral carbons and each one of them has four different groups on it, you can see that can lead to a whole ton of different stereo isomers, not just D and L, not just the mirror images. There could be a whole lot of other ones too. So a compound with a single chiral center can exist as two different enantiomers. Okay, so let's look at, at the monosaccharides again. So remember, in order for carbon to be chiral, we need two things. It needs to be tetrahedral. In other words, it needs to be attached to four different groups by single bonds. And so that leaves out this carbon and this carbon. They can't be chiral because they have a double bonded um, oxygen. So they're not tetrahedral. So that leaves them out. And on the bottom, carbon six has hydrogens on either side. So they're the same. So that isn't chiral either. So what that leaves us with is carbons two, three, four, and five are all tetrahedral and have four different groups. Um, so they have, they are all chiral. So glucose has four chiral centers. So that means there's a lot of different variations um, that you could make out of it. And again, as I keep, I'm going to keep repeating, only one of all of those possibilities is used as a source of energy in the body. So the number of different stereoisomers, as I sort of hinted to before, goes up. The more chiral carbons you have on a molecule, the more chances you have of making a variety of different compounds. And so the general formula is two raised to the n power. And n is the number of chiral centers. So if there is just one chiral center, two to the one, that's two, so you can have two different versions. If there's two different chiral, whoop, two different chiral um, centers, then you would have four different stereoisomers. We have 16 different stereoisomers possible for glucose. But then again, out of those 16, your body only uses one of them. The enzymes that break down uh, glucose and extract the energy through oxidation only recognizes D-glucose and nothing else. So that makes, so you can see that that's <laughs> nature and um, is basically designed this system around the shape of that one molecule and no other ones are used. So let's sort of review again the mirror images. So this is a, the, one of the simplest um, uh, monosaccharides. It's called glyceraldehyde. And if you remember the other night, we were talking about glycerol. 
Glycerol is a three carbon chain and it has um, hydroxyl groups at each uh, carbon. So this glyceraldehyde has, has been oxidized at the terminal um, uh, at the terminal hydroxyl group, the terminal carbon. And so one of those hydroxyl groups has been oxidized to an aldehyde. And so we call it glyceraldehyde. And so this can be a sugar because it has an aldehyde group. It has more than two carbons and the other two carbons have hydroxyl groups on it. That makes it a sugar. And so this is the simplest one um, there is. And so it's a good one to use for um, looking to determine um, the different enantiomers. So let's have a look. So here, all right, so if we look at the three-dimensional shapes, when we draw the sort of this regular projection, looking down the spine with the um, aldehyde or ketone functional group at the top. So we can see that the, the only the second carbon is where it is coming out at us. The two functional things attached to the carbon are coming out. And so on one side, we've got a hydroxyl group and the other side, we have uh, hydrogen. Now, the mirror image of that would be exactly the opposite. We would have hydrogen on the different side and the hydroxyl group on the opposite side. And so if you look at them, they're mirror images of each other. So if the hydroxyl uh, groups are my thumbs, when you hold your hands up together, there we go, you can see that the thumbs are on the same side. So they're mirror images, but they're actually on opposite sides of my hands. We call the hydroxyl group on this side, the L version, and we call it the hydroxyl group on the other side, the D version. Okay, and we'll get into how um, we um, can look at larger molecules and make the same uh, make the same test. So in these three D projections, as I mentioned. The wedges mean they're coming out at you, and the dashed lines mean they're going away from you. And so we draw what's called a Fisher projection, because it's, it's kind of hard to make all these dashes and, and everything. You get to make really messy um, uh, pictures. It's really hard to do when you have lots and lots and lots of, of, of atoms. It, you know, it's relatively straightforward when we're dealing with uh, with a single carbon with you know four different four different groups on it. But when you start dealing with these much larger molecules, it gets messy. So we use what's called a Fisher projection, and that's just basically good. it's going to look planar, but it will be drawn. Um, with the understanding that all the chiral carbons will have their groups coming out at us for reference, okay? So the chiral carbons themselves are not shown as a C because these are going to be basically like skeletal um, uh, drawings. And so they're just going to be at the intersection of lines. So that will be sort of a quick and easy way of saying, you know, if, there's, if you just see a cross line, that's a chiral carbon. And then the designation of whether it's a D sugar or an L sugar will be based on positioning that we just looked at for glyceraldehyde, the relative position of the hydroxyl group from the functional group. So let's have a look. So this is a wedge and dash that we would be familiar with. So these are all wedges, so they're all coming out at us. And again, like I said, it's going to be difficult to, to always get those right and make them messy. So this is the Fisher projection. 
So it's flat. It looks flat, but it actually isn't because it is used, as I mentioned in the last slide, we would are to assume that the um, all those groups that are connected to cross lines, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon. And all of those groups are coming out at us. And so how do we use this particular representation to say whether it's a D sugar or an L sugar? Well, D sugars have the hydroxyl group on the chiral carbon furthest from the carbonyl. So the carbonyl group is here. What is the carbon, what is the chiral carbon furthest from that? Well, we go one, two, three, four. Well, the fifth one is in chiral. Carbon six is in chiral because it has hydrogens, it has two hydrogens, so that's not chiral. So the last, the furthest carbon that is chiral away from the carbonyl, now remember, it's going to be carbonyl when it's um, an, an aldehyde, and it's going to be a carbonyl when it's a ketone. So carbonyl, we're going to be, have to remember what a carbonyl group means. So it means that this, this carbon is the one furthest away from the carbonyl. So we look and see which side is the hydroxyl group on. Is it on the right side? Is it on the left side? If it's on the left side, this, this part is at least easy to remember. If it's on the l -l -l left side, it is a l -l -l sugar. If it's on the right side, it's the other one. It's D. So that's it. So this would be D because it's on the right side. If we just flip that around and put the hydroxyl group on the other side, then it becomes an L sugar. And so the ones that we use for energy in nature are the D version. So when we're drawing in antiomers, the mirror images of each other, we have to see that each and every chiral carbon matches. So we have our one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Those are our chiral carbons. So we have to make sure that each and every group is a mirror image of each other. So these two hydroxyls, they're mirror images. These two hydrogens, they're mirror images. These two hydroxyls, they're mirror images. And these two are mirror images. And so we can say that those are indeed mirror images and antiomers of each other. If any one of those other groups is flipped over, they're not in antiomers anymore. They become something different. We call them diastereomers. So this would be, we have the, hyd we have the hyd um, hydroxyl group furthest away. On the right side, that's D. And now the hydroxyl group is opposite to that. It's on the left side, that's L, glucose. So let's look at some other ways we could arrange the hydroxyl groups on uh, a monosaccharide. So this is glucose. This is galactose. You've probably heard of, of galactose. So we look at glucose and galactose and we can see they're both have aldehyde groups. So they're both aldoses, so far so good. They both have six carbons, so they're both hexoses. They're both aldohexoses, okay. Um, but when we look and see the arrangement of 
the groups on the four chiral carbons, we can see that they are not mirror images of each other. So those are not mirror images of each other. Those are not mirror images of each other. These are, and these are not. So we can't superimpose them. We can't, they're not mirror images of, of each other. They have the, exactly the same chemical structure. They have exactly the same atoms arranged in slightly different ways in three-dimensional space. So we call those diastereomers. They are not exact mirror images of each other. And notice they're both D because the furthest um, carbon away, furthest chiral carbon away from the functional group at the top, they're both on the right side. So they're both D, but they're not um, enantiomers of each other. Okay. So some of the important six carbon uh, carbohydrates, glucose, we're all familiar uh, with glucose. It's known by a bunch of other names as well. It's known as dextrose, uh, corn sugar. It's also known as blood sugar, which is kind of nasty to think about. The next sugar is galactose. Now, you don't really see galactose by itself. You do see it in a disaccharide called lactose. We're probably familiar with lactose because it's it's milk sugar. Um, so when milk sugar is hydrolyzed, um, it releases glucose and galactose. So the galactose that's needed to make um, uh, uh, lactose actually comes from glucose. So the body takes D-glucose and then basically rearranges the atoms to form D-galactose and then puts them together to form lactose. Fructose is the most abundant keto hexose. And you'll find it in honey. There's a ton of it in honey, like 40% of honey is, is the simple six carbon fructose. And in sweet fruit, I mean, that's where it comes from, right? Um, it's also referred to as levulose. I don't know anybody who actually refers it to that. But you remember when I was talking about um, earlier why originally we um, called these things D and L and R and S. How do they get these uh, conventional names? It's because when you shoot polarized light through a solution of these, um, depending on what orientation uh, the molecule is in, it bends the light, it, it, it bends it to a specific uh, um, amount, depending on whether it's D or whether it's L. Fructose is referred to as levulose because it really pushes, the, it, it rotates um, polarized light strongly to the left. So that's where originally D and L came from. So. When polarized light is shone through it, it really, really rotates it. So that's how it got that particular name. So these are the structure of, of the most important ones. So we've seen glucose already, and now galactose and fructose. What are the basic differences between them? We'll talk about that again on Tuesday as well. So these are just the relative sweetness of some of these. You can see that the artificial sweeteners, um, aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, though you really can't see them right here, um, they go up to like you know, 50, 60,000 times as sweet as naturally occurring uh, substances. They just have the same shape. And you can see that fructose is the sweetest of the sort of the of the monosaccharides sucrose is not quite as sweet as fructose that's why fruit tastes so damn good 
because it's got that uh, really, really sweet monosaccharide in it. So another way that monosaccharides can adopt a different shape is that they can cyclize. They can form a ring. And most of the time, um, they are in a, in, a, in a ring structure. About two thirds of the time, they'll be in a ring versus linear about one third of the time. And that occurs when you have the carbonyl group being reacted with one of the alcohol groups. Now, oxygen is electron rich and gets attracted to the carbon, which is electron poor because it has the partial positive charge due to the presence of the partial negative charge on the oxygen of the carbonyl. So basically, it sort of runs up from behind and then cyclizes. It makes, it makes a bond. And so instead, so one end reacts with the other end and you form a ring. And that occurs both with the aldehyde uh, carbonyl group and the ketone carbonyl group, both of them. So this would be with carbon one. So remember on an aldehyde is on carbon one. That's what makes it an aldehyde. It's on the, it's on the end of the chain. And the ketone is on carbon two. And we call this bond a hemiacetal. It's not quite the same as an ester bond. It's a little bit different because what happens is that when these electrons from the, from the alcohol group, from the hydroxyl group, come up and attack the carbon, it then pushes electrons out to the double bonded uh, carbon. And then basically what you're left with is a new alcohol group, a new, carb a new hydroxyl group. So we get rid of the double bonded oxygen. With an ester, we still have the double bonded um, oxygen. With a hemiacetal, that double bonded carbon is gone. And so basically you're left with one R group, another R group through a carbon with a hydroxyl group on it. And we call that particular arrangement a hemiacetal. So here's how um, glucose forms a ring. So remember, the aldehyde is on carbon one, and it, carbon five actually swings around and it's this hydroxyl group, uh, which, I'm sorry, um, hang on. Yeah, carbon five swings around. There's the hydroxyl group on carbon five and basically attacks the carbon in the carbonyl group here transfers its electrons, swings it out to this double bond, and we form a new hydroxyl. So now carbon one has a hydroxyl group on it, which before it didn't have. It had a carbonyl group attached to it and a hydrogen. It had an aldehyde. Now it has an alcohol group. And this is the hemiacetal bond here. So there's your hemiacetal group. And then this becomes really, really important when we're trying to determine what kind of uh, sugar this is. Because what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the relative position of this hydroxyl group versus the position of that um, carbon number six. And so this is a different kind of projection. This is like a ring projection. And so 
we have either groups pointing down or groups pointing up. And so we want to see whether or not this group here, this hydroxyl group on carbon one, and this group, carbon six, are either cis on the same side of the ring or trans. And we call this particular carbon now gets a special name. And we call it the anomeric carbon. The anomeric carbon is the only one that's bonded directly to two oxygens. It's bonded to, it's bonded to the oxygen in the hemiacetal um, bond, and it has its own hydroxyl group. So you can always find the anomeric carbon by looking for the one that's bound to two oxygens. So that's going to be carbon one. And so we always basically draw the ring structure to look like this, where carbon one is here and carbon six is there. And so then two, three, four, five. Okay. So carbon six will always be pointing up. And then basically what we're looking for is where's the hydroxyl group on carbon one? Is it pointing up and is cis, or is it pointing down and is trans from carbon six? So we call these two different versions anomers. Not the same as um, um, the diastereomers or the enantiomers we were looking at before, because this is now a ring. And so we want to be able to quickly determine what shape it is because there's two different ways it can go when when carbon 5 attacks attacks with a terrible thing to do when carbon 5 attacks carbon 1 it can either push the hydroxyl group the new hydroxyl group up or it can push it down so these two different anomers we call them alpha and beta they're determined whether or not they're cis or trans. So in the alpha anomer, that hydroxyl group is trans to the ring, to the um, carbon six. So carbon six is pointing up and the hydroxyl group will be pointing down. That would be alpha. In the beta anomer, the hydroxyl group is cis, it's on the same side as carbon six. So that would be beta. So carbon six, as I mentioned, is always drawn pointing up. So the easiest way to determine whether it's alpha or beta is just look at, find the anomeric carbon. It's the only one attached to two different oxygens and look and see, is the hydroxyl group pointing up beta. Is it pointing down? Alpha. And that'll become important uh, when we're looking at longer chains because they are going to start stacking themselves together and they're either going to adopt alpha or beta conformations. So let's have a look. So here we've got alpha D glucose. And why is it alpha? Because here's carbon six and there's carbon one and the um, hydroxyl group down. It's in trans. So that is alpha. Now let's go over and look at the beta anomer. As usual, carbon six is always pointing up and we look for the hydroxyl on carbon one. It's also pointing up. It's cis to it. That is beta. And the same goes for uh, fructose. Always look at carbon six. Now remember, fructose is going to look slightly different because it is a ketose. So carbon one 
is no is no longer um, the the animer. Two is now, and so we look at carbon two because that's where the carboxyl group was. That's where the carboxyl group was. That's where the new hydroxyl group is going to appear. So it's the only one that's attached to a oxygen on this side and oxygen on that side. They're on opposite sides of the ring. They are trans alpha. And then when they're on the same side, beta. Okay. So monosaccharides and basically the um, uh, short uh, polysaccharides, um, um, oligosaccharides and disaccharides are crystalline solids that are really soluble uh, in water. Sugar dissolves in water quite well. And the chemical behavior of these things, or the chemical properties, is determined by all these functional groups that it has on it. One test that is really common for seeing whether uh, carbohydrates are present is to see whether a reducing sugar is present. And that is a carbohydrate that is capable of reducing a mild oxidizing agent without breaking apart first. So let's have a look and see what those sugars would be. So this is the Benedict test, and this is the reagent. So we have copper citrate, which is mild um, um, reducing, I'm uh, sorry, a mild oxidizing agent. And so we want to see if it can oxidize um, one of the groups on the sugar. So here we have an aldose because it's got the aldehyde on the end and it gets oxidized into a carboxylic acid. So when that happens, this gets converted into a precipitate that falls out. And, and so you can see it starts out as a, as a blue solution. And so if you add a reducing sugar, you get a precipitate of copper oxide. That only is done if you have a free um, carboxyl group. If you have a free carboxyl group, you can oxidize that. Remember that carboxyl groups can be oxidized to further into carboxylic acids. But if you don't have a free one, then like sucrose, it just stays blue. Sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. So what does that mean? So non-reducing are bonded through their anomeric centers with that acetal linkage. And so when you look at this, you can see that they don't have any aldehyde or ketone groups any longer. There's no, there's no C double bond O anywhere here. And so the only way you could be able to get one is if you broke that glycosidic bond. That's what we call a bond that holds two sugars together, a glycosidic bond. Until we break that, there aren't any carbonyl groups. So they don't have anything um, there that's, that's able to be oxidized by a weak oxidizing agent. So they don't form an aldehyde or a ketone group, and so they're not reducing. All right, so we're gonna take a break there and we'll do part two next. All right.